I am so excited for this week's Parsha podcast because we are going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do today, instead of one big idea in the Parsha, I prepared a grab bag of ideas on the Parsha, five different insights, five different discoveries on the Parsha. Let me know if you like this new format. Do I need to send my email address again? I don't think so. I think you all already know my email address, and you could email me if you like this new format. So here we go. Let's begin with the beginning of the Parsha. Jacob has successfully disentangled himself from his father-in-law from Laban, and he is coming back to face the music to meet his brother Esav, who has very violent and nefarious intentions to get back at Jacob for what he did. And he sends messengers, and the messengers come back and say, by the way, Esav is coming back towards you. You're going to meet. You're going to rendezvous. And he has 400 warriors, and he is very angry. Despite the 20 years, he still has very violent plans for you. So Jacob launches into a prayer, and part of the prayer is he tells God, I have become small, I have become diminished, because you have done so much kindness and so much goodness to me, because when I crossed over originally, 20 years prior, when he was escaping from Asaph, he crossed over with just this staff, with just this stick. And now look at me. I have four wives. I have 12 children. I have a tremendous amount of wealth and cattle and sheep. Look how much goodness you have done to me. Now I'm worried maybe this has exhausted all my merits and now I am vulnerable to Asaph. So as an aside, my sister-in-law, she once told me that her grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And came to America after the war, got married, built a family, built a business, of course, lost everything back home. And she said that every year they would have a get-together with the whole family. And all of his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. And every year he would give the exact same speech. And he would quote Jacob. He said, I crossed over the river, just like Jacob says, and all I had was a stick. All I had was a staff. And now look at this tremendous blessing and this tremendous legacy that I have. So Jacob is acknowledging the goodness that God did to him. All he had, he had no gold, no silver. All he had was this staff. Now Rashi tells us something interesting. With my stick, I crossed the Jordan. If you read it very carefully, very critically, it sounds like the stick assisted him in crossing the Jordan. So, of course, the Jordan straddles the eastern border of the land of Canaan. So Jacob is escaping from Canaan to Haran, which is in Mesopotamia, today Iraq. He has to cross over the Jordan. All he has is his staff with him. And... He used the staff to get across. Says Rashi, very interesting. He placed the staff into the Jordan. And just like the splitting of the sea, and just like when Joshua entered the land many centuries hence, the Jordan split. Jacob traveling by himself, escaping from his brother, absconding from his home to go to Laban to get married and to eventually build his family. When he's crossing over the Jordan, the Jordan, again, split for him. And here's point number one. What is the purpose of this miracle? You know, when the Jewish people leave in Egypt and there's the splitting of the sea, there's a lot of people watching. It's there to save the Jewish people from the Egyptians who are pursuing them. There's a lot of reasons to have that particular miracle. Joshua, same thing. They're entering the land. There's millions of people. We want to impress the nation. We want to really get people excited about entering the land. Here, this is Jacob traveling alone. You don't imagine he needs a boost of faith. After all, this is Jacob, one of the most important, uh, righteous, holiest people that have ever lived. You'd imagine he has all the faith that he ever, he'd ever need. Why do we have this miracle? So maybe we can speculate an answer. Rashi tells us, that when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esav, 
he had taken with him some assets to go and court a wife from the daughters of Laban. But Asab had sent his son Eliphaz to go pursue him and go kill him. And Eliphaz encounters his uncle Jacob, and he says, I'm sorry, I have strict instructions from daddy, from Asab, I got to kill you. And Jacob says, well, you can't, I don't want you to kill me, but here's what we should do to make your dad happy. The Talmud tells us that if someone is poor on a certain level, to a certain degree, they're considered like they're dead. Take all my money, take all my possessions, and then I'll be rendered a pauper. And a pauper, to a certain extent, is like dead. And therefore, you go back to your father, go back to Asim and say, well, I killed Jacob because I took away all his stuff. So Jacob has been divested of all of his assets. And the only thing he has is this staff. I think there's a very powerful lesson over here. The Almighty is showing him, despite all, you were forced to steal your brother's blessing. You didn't want to do it. Rebecca forced you to do it. Ace of your older brother, you would have been happy if he had the blessing. You would have been fine with that. You're forced to steal it, and now you're forced to flee for your life. And it's not only that. All of your possessions are all taken away from you. That's a very depressing state to be in. Not only are you running away from your own brother wants to murder you, but you're completely penniless. All you have is just a staff. But you know what else you have with you? The Almighty is with you. And he's telling you, you see this staff? That's all you have, but look at the power of the staff. And look at the fact that you have me on your side. You have the Almighty on your side. There's nothing that can stand in your way, not even the Jordan River. So I think this is a very heartwarming little vignette, little tidbit, little anecdote that Rashi tells us that at maybe the nadir of Jacob's life, fleeing from his family, going to parts unknown, completely penniless, and of course on a mission to go found the Jewish people, the Almighty, so to speak, winks at him and tells him, I got your back. Look what we could do. I'm still on your side. This is all part of the plan. This is part of the test. Eventually, it will end, of course, very well. Now, incidentally, the Midrash tells us that this staff has a long history. This staff was in the hands of Jacob, of course. In Natural's part show, we're going to read how Judah gives a staff to a woman, finds out later on that it's his daughter-in-law. He gives her a staff because she is masquerading as a prostitute. Midrash tells us that's the same staff. Moshe has a staff in Egypt that he uses dual miracles. Aaron uses that same staff. David, when he goes to battle with Goliath, this is all the exact same staff reveals to us in the Midrash. And in the future, King Messiah is going to use this very staff that was used to split the Jordan by Jacob This very staff is hidden away to be rediscovered by the King Messiah. I think it's kind of interesting to hear about the batch story and the future role of this staff given to very special people to be able to batter through any resistance. That's the first thought. Second thought, chapter 32, verse 32 as well, 32, 32. And this comes after the nocturnal struggle with the angel of Asav. Jacob has a fight that lasts the whole night. And afterwards, it seems like it's a stalemate. And the angel really wants to go. And he dislocates the hip of Jacob. And Jacob starts limping. We find out that's why we don't need the Gedanasha, the sciatica. But verse tells us, Vayizrach lo Hashemesh, the sun shone for Jacob, and he is limping. And the question is, You know, the sun is a star that shines for everyone. So why does the verse say that the sun shone or it rose for Jacob? So Rashi tells us, very interesting, that the sun shone for him because the sun is used for healing. And quotes a verse to that effect. Then he tells us something really interesting. The sun actually shone that day for longer than its allotted amount of time. 
And where did the sun get that extra energy from? Because 20 something years earlier, when Jacob was going east, fleeing from Asav and praying on Mount Moriah, the verse there says that he went to sleep, Kiva Hashemesh. This is the beginning of Parshas Vayetze, last week's Parsha. He goes to sleep because the sun has set. And Rashi there tells us, again, of course, this is from the Midrash, from the Talmud. Rashi tells us that this was a sudden sunset. Really, on that particular day, the sun was supposed to, was scheduled to set much later. But the Almighty really wanted Jacob to go to sleep on Mount Moriah. Because, of course, that was a very memorable sleep. He has the dream, and he sees the angels going up and down the ladder, gets the amazing blessing. The body wanted that to happen. And therefore, he prematurely caused the sunset. So the sun on that day shone for fewer hours than it should have. Therefore, there were a few hours, so to speak, that the sun had in its bank account, in its piggy bank. And when were those hours unleashed? 20 years later, Jacob has a fight with the angel, and in order to accelerate his healing, the Almighty makes the sun shine longer, and thus, even in the store, balancing things out to aid Jacob in his quest for a healing. What an interesting idea. The sun became dark, so to speak, for Jacob's benefit, so he could go to sleep, get those blessings. 22 years prior. And now the sun remained lit for longer, also for his benefit. So that's an interesting thing just in general, but I think there's a deep insight over here. Our sages compare the power of Esav to the sun. And there's a general motif in Jewish philosophy that the Jewish people are similar to the moon, and Asav is similar to the sun. Of course, we follow a lunar monthly cycle as opposed to we don't have a solely solar calendar. But there's an idea here. Asav is somewhat comparable to the sun. He's bright, powerful, hot, magnificent. But ultimately, just like the sun, it's subject to setting and to disappearing, at least for nighttime. So I think it's interesting maybe even inspiring, that Jacob, specifically when he is reeling from blows of Esau, of course, Eliphaz robs him of all his money, per the instructions of Esau. Esau's angel fights with him the whole night, dislocates his hip. Immediately after those two episodes, what does the Almighty do? He manipulates the sun, so to speak, the nominal force of Esau. The money manipulates the sun to aid Jacob. It sets early so that he can have the very consequential and inspiring dream and prophecy. And it delays from setting to heal him from the injuries that he sustained while struggling with the angel of Esau. I think it's a very interesting idea that the Almighty specifically uses, so to speak, the force of Esau to neuter or to limit or to attenuate or to mitigate Esau's damage that he does to Jacob. Now, the third thought maybe is one that I shouldn't say because it's a little bit wild and I don't profess to really know what I'm talking about. As the wonderful audience of the Parsha Podcast knows, sometimes I say things and I don't really know what they mean, but that's just the way it is. That's what happens on the Parsha Podcast. So here's the thought. There's a very troubling story in our Parsha, as everyone knows. Dina, the daughter of Jacob, she goes out on a little trip. She gets accosted. She gets assaulted. She gets raped by this terrible guy whose name is Shechem, who lives in the city of Shechem, which is a little confusing. She's raped, and then he he wants to marry her to add insult to injury. And eventually, she is avenged 
by her brothers, specifically Shimon and Levi, they come and they have this whole ruse, circumcise yourself, we'll let you marry Dina. Day three, everyone is bedridden and they come and they decimate the entire city. So, of course, there's lots of problems and questions with this story on all fronts. You know, how do we explain what happened to Dina? What happened to Jacob? Who are these people, Shechem and Hamor, in the city of Shechem? Why does everyone in the city apparently deserve to die? It's a question the Ramam talks about, all the commentaries talk about. But the Kabbalists reveal something quite provocative in this story. And what they tell us is that there's this concept called a certain spark, if you will, of a soul. And there's this idea, it's one of the big themes of Jewish philosophy, certainly once we get to the Kabbalistic literature, there's this idea that there could be holiness that is embedded and submerged and hidden in very unholy places. Very important and counterintuitive idea that sometimes it's the holiness that is hiding or that is masked in very unholy places. What the Kabbalists reveal to us is that what, what is happening over here in the story is that Shechem, this terrible villain, who takes advantage of the poor innocent girl, his soul, like the verse says, his soul cleaved to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. There was something in his soul, which we assume, of course, that's a spirit, it's a positive thing, right? The soul of Shechem is cleaving to the soul of Dina. So what the Kabbalists revealed to us is that there was some sort of deep spiritual connection between two people that really are opposites. You know, Dina comes from the most prestigious family in the world, the daughter, of course, of Jacob and Leah, the granddaughter of Isaac from Abraham. This is the greatest pedigree, the scion of an amazing family. And then there is this guy, Shechem, a total heath and a total hooligan, a terrible guy, a criminal. And yet we're told, at least it's hinted to in scripture, that their souls had some sort of attraction, some sort of connection. So the Arizal, the greatest of all the Kabbalists, he tells us that there was a very holy soul that is trapped Amidst, so to speak, this guy, this terrible guy, this very unholy guy, Shem. Moreover, and this is where it gets even stranger, the Arizal was able to identify who the person was that is the actualized version of this soul. And what he's explaining over here is that Dina is coming here maybe unwittingly, but she's coming and she's extracting a very holy soul that is trapped in a very unholy place, namely amongst these terrible people in the city of Shechem, in the individual of Shechem. And the Arizal tells us that there is a sage of the Mishnaic era whose name was Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. He's one of the people that the Romans killed in a very horrific, macabre, brutal, grisly way. He was the one that was surrounded, was enveloped in Torah scrolls and then placed on fire, but the fire was placed at a certain distance to prolong his agony and prevent it from just dying. One of the great heroes of the Mishnahic era, in fact, the father-in-law of Rabbi Meir. So think of him, you know, in the end of the first century, beginning of the second century of the common era. Rabbi Chaniva Trajan, we're told, his holy and elevated soul was trapped amidst Shechem, and Dina came and extracted that soul and brought it, so to speak, back to the good side. What a strange and interesting idea. And Arizal adds that if you look at the verse when they're having this negotiation, which of course turns out to be a ruse, 
But Shechem and his father Hamor, they want to make a pitch to Jacob and his family, and they say, Vehaaretz hine rachvas yedaim. The land is very broad. But the word rachvas, which means broad, is also the letters of Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. Now, maybe going even a level deeper, if you do study the story of Shechem and Rabbi Hanima Tradion in the Talmud, you do find some incredible parallels that lend credence to this very unusual idea. But I think this is an idea that we have seen before, and we're going to see more of it, in fact, even today. That there is sometimes holiness that is trapped in the most non-holy places, and the perhaps collective mission of the Jewish people is to retrieve those sparks and once again restore them to their prominence. Okay, that's the third thought. And again, I fully acknowledge it's a very advanced Kabbalistic idea, but that's what we do sometimes on the Parsha podcast. Maybe it's to our peril, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, here's the fourth thought. This comes from chapter 35, verse 26. And this is after the, another troubling episode, the episode of Reuven and Bilhah, after the death of Rachel, Jacob stations his primary bed in the tent of Bilhah, and Reuven feels like it's an affront. His mother, after all, she's a real wife. Bilhah's just like a secondary wife. And he takes Jacob's primary bed, and he drags it out of Bilhah's tent and brings it to his mother Leah's tent. And the Torah is very clear immediately after this story is described. It delineates the 12 sons of Jacob. And Rashi tells us, don't think, don't be under the impression that Reuven did something really bad. It was bad, but ultimately he didn't lose his standing as one of the 12 sons of Jacob. But when that part of the Parsha concludes... The verse tells us, Ela b'nei Yaakov, these are the sons of Jacob, Asher yulad lo Padan Aram, that were born to him in Padan Aram. Padan Aram is where Laban lives. And the question all the commentaries ask is, wait a minute. Benjamin was not born in Padan Aram. Benjamin, after all, was born right before the death of Rachel in Nara Parsha, way after Jacob had hightailed out of Padan Aram. So why does the verse say, these are the sons of Jacob, apparently referring to all of them, that were born in Padan Aram? So all the commentaries talk about this. And most of them say, well, you know, it's the majority, etc. But the Cheskuni, one of the commentaries, he says something which is kind of mind-blowing. He says, indeed, Benjamin was born in Padan Aram. Why? After Joseph was born, this is six years before Jacob eventually left. After Joseph is born, his mother Rachel names him Joseph. And one of the reasons why she names him Joseph, which means to add, to give, to have more. Why does she name him Joseph? Because it was a prayer to have another son. Rachel, she had a prayer after the birth of Joseph to have another son. And that prayer was done where? That prayer was done in Padan Aram. And that prayer was answered and Benjamin was born. And therefore, if we are to assess where was Benjamin born? So, of course, in actuality, the labor and delivery, well, that was near Bethlehem. That was essentially in the land of Canaan. But when the Torah views the birth of Benjamin, it views the spiritual birth of Benjamin. And the spiritual birth happened many years before Benjamin was actually born. Rachel submits a prayer, and the prayer was answered. And Benjamin was, so to speak, spiritually conceived right after Joseph was born. It wasn't actualized till many years later. But once the prayer was submitted, the die is cast, the system is in motion, the balls are rolling, and the prayer has been answered. Now, it took many years 
for everyone else to notice. But the Torah, when they see, the Torah sees Benjamin, the Torah sees someone who was born in Padana Ram. Because the prayer, which is the spiritual force that brought about Benjamin, that was done there. And therefore, that is more critical to his birth than the actual place of birth. I think this is a very powerful insight. Sometimes we pray, and it seems like we're not answered. It's been a year. I've been praying. I got nothing. And years later, we get what we wanted. And here we find out that in the Torah's view, the prayer is the achievement. And sometimes it takes a while for us to notice it. But here we find something very striking, that where was Benjamin born? Benjamin was born in Padan Aram. What a provocative, powerful insight we find here in the Chesroni. Okay, finally, the fifth thought. Maybe the most controversial one of the podcast. We push it all the way to the end. Hopefully the people that will call me out, they've tuned out already. This is just for the diehards. Maybe I could slip this past y'all. Let's see. So at the end of the Parsha, chapter 36, it details the descendants of Asaph. And it's a very long description, who he married, who was a primary wife, who was a secondary wife, the travels of Asaph, Asaph's children's wives and secondary wives and concubines. A very long description dedicated to Asaph's family. And we meet a gentleman, an individual, who is the grandson of Asaph, and his name is Amalek. And of course, Amalek is the worst villain of all the villains. This is the father of the nation that's going to be the nation of Amalek that's going to cause us so much harm, pain, and suffering over our history. Now, who is Amalek's father, Amalek the individual? That is Eliphaz, the aforementioned son of Asaph. Who is his mother? Who's the mother of Amalek? It's a woman named Timna. So we find something really interesting about Timna. The Talmud tells us, this is the Talmud of the book of Sanhedrin, page 99b, that this Timna, she was a princess. And she really wanted to convert. She really wanted to be part of the Jewish people. And she went to Abraham. Will you convert me? I want to join you. And Abraham rebuffed her. And she went to Isaac. Same thing. And she went to Jacob. Same thing. So what she say? She says, you know what? I can't join this family, at least not the, you know, the most important chain in this family. I'll go to the knockoff version. I'll go to Asa's family. And she went to Asa's family and she became a concubine to his son, Eliphaz. And what was Timna's rationale for this? She had said, it is better for me to be a maidservant, a second wife, a concubine for this family than to be a princess in a different family, in a different nation. And therefore, because she had this unrequited love of holiness, she had a Amalek. And Amalek caused so much pain to the Jewish people. Why? Because we should not have distanced Timna. We should not have rejected and repelled and repulsed Timna. And therefore, to a certain extent, her Going to the dark side to Asav is our fault, and therefore it comes back to bite us in the form of Amalek, her son. Really interesting idea. Timna, the mother of Amalek, she actually craved holiness, but she did not get the acceptance, and therefore we have Amalek. So first of all, it's important to note that the words here used in the Talmud are almost identical to the words used with respect to Hagar. Of course, Hagar is also a secondary wife of Abraham. She is the maidservant of Sarah. Eventually, she marries Abraham, and she is the mother of Ishmael. If you look at the first time that Hagar is mentioned in chapter 16 of Genesis, 
it tells us that Sarah had an Egyptian maidservant and she eventually proposed that Abraham take her as a secondary wife or concubine. Rashi tells us, Bat Parohaita, she was the daughter of Pharaoh. And when Abraham and, and Sarah, they were in Egypt and Pharaoh, and everyone saw the miracles of Abraham and Sarah, Pharaoh said, it's better that my daughter should be a maidservant in this family and not a princess in a different family. It's almost the exact same process, so to speak, that Timna had that is resembling Hagar. Now, I want to stress, Amalek is a very big subject in the Torah. They are the first nation to dare wage battle with us after the Exodus. But I think it's very interesting and noteworthy that when we look at their pedigree, the first thing that we know about this family, the first drive, so to speak, of the antecedents of Amalek is a certain craving for holiness. Now, to add another interesting component to this, what is the ultimate end of Amalek? So the Talmud, again, in Sanhedrin, this time not 99b, it's 96b, we find out that Haman, of course, he's the archetype of Amalek, he really is the heir of a god, he's Amalek, and he is, of course, the villain of the Perm story. Talmud tells us that he had some descendants that converted. And not only did they convert, they studied Torah in B'nai Brak. B'nai Brak was, and still is, incidentally, a very holy and spiritual city, lots of Torah. Rabbi Akiva was the rabbi of B'nai Brak. And one of the students there was a descendant of Haman. It's almost like it comes full circle. There is this drive to be accepted by the Jewish people that Timna had. It gets rejected. And somehow that transposes to the evilness of Amalek. And it's it's really our fault. We have no one but ourselves to blame, like the Talmud says. And eventually, after this cycle, so to speak, of evil is done, and Haman has been hung on the tree with his ten sons, one of his descendants actually completes the circle, actualize what Timna began, and this latent holiness comes to fruition. Now, maybe we could even speculate that the idea of Messiah, that is when the evil of Amalek is finally stamped out and the original drive of Timna is brought to fruition. But I think there's another point here. The Talmud tells us that the heretics, the people who reject the divinity, the veracity of the Torah, there was one verse that they would always cite as proof positive that the Torah is not divine. And that is the verse from our Parsha where it tells us that the sister of a guy named Lotan is Timna. So Timna, the mother of Amalek, the concubine of Aliphaz, her brother is Lotan, who is a prince. And this unnecessary backstory, all the people who reject the ability of the Torah, they say, hey, this is proof the Torah is not legit, because after all, who cares who Timna's brother is? And thus... The Torah must just have this unnecessary fat, so to speak, extra verses. It's not divine. And Talmud explains, well, no, this does give us insight because she was the sister of Lotan. And Lotan is a prince, so she was a princess. And nevertheless, she said, let me be a Pelegish, let me be a concubine in the family of Abraham. So I think there's something really fascinating going on over here. Timna is the mother of evil. Yet we find that she has holiness, latent holiness within her. And we see this amazing parallel. The verse that talks about Timna and who her family is, Achos Lotan Timna, 
the sister of Lotan is Timnah. This verse is the, the, the prototypical verse that seems to be mundane and trivial. It's not holy. It's not valuable. It's not important. It's, necess- it's, not, it's not necessary. And yet we find value there too. It's almost like we could say that the Torah is a mirror of the world. Both the Torah and the world, both of them are the Almighty's handiwork. And we look at a Malik, we look at this terrible nation, and we find nothing redeeming about them. And we look at the verse of Timnah, the mother of a Malik, and we find nothing valuable in it. And then we discover that both of them, if you dig deep enough, you find insight, you find some value, you find something good. And thus, Timna, she is the mother of Amalek, and she's the one who represents that small, slight flicker of goodness, that initial drive that maybe eventually gets actualized, the grandchildren or the descendants of Haman study Torah. And thus, she is not somebody, and Amalek is not something that is pure, pure, pure evil. Maybe it is mostly pure, pure, pure evil. But even Amalek has something redeeming. And even the verse of Timna also has something redeeming. I think this is a very messianic idea. But the idea of, of Messiah is when even the evil, so to speak, recognizes God. Even Amalek, even Timna, we find something righteous about it. We don't think of, of, of the messianic era as being something that is limited to us. To the contrary. It seems like we're doing pretty, pretty okay, at least when we're, when we're acting properly. But it is, so to speak, the actualization, the bringing to light, the surfacing, so to speak, of that tiny flicker of holiness that exists in everything. Okay, those are the five ideas on the Parsha. And let us quickly get down to this week's drum roll, please. A and Q. So Jacob is having a long nocturnal struggle with the angel, and it's daybreak, it's morning, and the angel wants to go. And he says, send me, because it is the morning. So Rashi tells us that Jacob said, so what? It's the morning, let's keep on going. And the angel responded, no, I'm an angel, and I have to go praise God. I have to go sing before God. Okay, so Jacob says to him, I'll send you, but first you have to bless me. And he, this is the first of two times in a parsha where Jacob is renamed Israel. The angel of Esav says, okay, now you're called Israel as well as Jacob. And that is affirmed later on in the parsha by the Almighty. That's the blessing that Jacob receives. But here's the question. The Talmud elaborates on this dialogue. This is the Talmud, the book of Chulin, page 91b. And the Talmud tells us that initially, when the angel told Jacob, I have to go because it's morning, Jacob responded, well, are you a thief? Are you scared of daylight? Are you a kidnapper? Why are you so worried about the morning? So he said, no, I'm an angel. And from the day that I was created. We have to remember that angels are also creations. Only God is a creator. From the day that I was created, it was never my turn to recite the song, to praise God. And today is my day. And Talmud ultimately explains that the Jewish people are greater than angels. We could praise God all the time. But the angels, some of them say it only once a day. And some of them say it once a week, and some say once a month, and some say once a year, and some say once every seven years, and some say once every yovel, i.e. every 50 years. And some angels, the seventh and lowest class of angels, they recite praise of God once in their existence. This angel, the angel of Esav, was of the lowest variety, the lowest level of angel, and it never said praise of God. And there was only one time in all of history that the angel was designated to recite the praise for God. And that is today. But he is in this tussle with Jacob and it's time. The clock is ticking, so to speak. 
and Jacob doesn't want to let him go, and he, Jacob only relinquishes him. Jacob only releases him, sends him to go say his praise of God on high, only after he gives Jacob a blessing. So I think this raises some really interesting questions. First of all, Jacob is accosted by this terrible monster beast. And then when it kind of ends in a stalemate, Jacob apparently wants to continue struggling. Jacob doesn't release the angel. So we can maybe pursue the question of why is Jacob insisting on prolonging this encounter? Another question we could perhaps ask is, why is daybreak the time of praise? Can't praise God in the middle of the night, in the afternoon maybe? In twilight, noon, late morning? Why specifically daybreak? A third question perhaps we can ask is, why couldn't he praise God from where he was? He's in the middle of a fight with Jacob and he praises God. Why does he have to, so to speak, ascend to heaven above to do the praise? Those are three questions I think we could ask. But here's the question that I want to ask. Here's this week's A and Q. Why was this day precisely the day that the angel of Asaph was designated to sing praise to God. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it a wonderful coincidence? The one time in the Torah that I can think of, that we have a fight between an angel and a man, is this very dramatic story thing of our parsha. Jacob is fighting the whole night with this angel. Oh, and this just happens to be, this is the very same day of all the days of all of existence that this particular angel is on slate, is designated to recite praise for God. So the question I want to pose is, what is the connection? There's, there's got to be a connection, right? What is the connection between what is happening here when Jacob is fighting, is struggling with the angel, and the fact that this specifically is the time, is the day, where the angel is supposed to praise God? That's the question. If you have any answers, email them to me. Rabbi will be at gmail.com. Let's get to the last week's A and Q. And the question was, why does Asaph and Asaph's descendants, Amalek, shall we say, why do they specifically target Jacob and the Jewish people when they are about to return to the land? Now, when we started this A and Q project at the beginning of this current cycle of the Torah, so the first week I got so many responses, I said, okay, well, this is just the first week. I'm sure after a bunch of weeks, things will subside. People are excited because it's, you know, the new shiny thing. But eventually things will restore. Maybe we'll get one or two responses every week. But I'm getting more answers and better answers and sharper answers. It's almost like it's gaining steam. So again, this is another proof that this Parsha podcast audience is just the best one that exists. Got so many answers, so many interesting answers. Maybe Asaph didn't attack because he was scared of of Laban. Maybe Amalek, whenever the Jewish people are surrounded by other people, maybe that would be a threat to them. They only attack when the Jewish people are at their weakest and the most convenient time to try to annihilate the Jewish people. That's when they attack. Maybe when we are mobile, we are moving, we're bunched together, we're easy to knock off. We got a great answer uh, from a listener who noted that Asaph slash Amalek, they know that when we are surrounded by other people in other nations, then we could kind of self-immolate. We could destroy ourselves. We could self-destruct. And that's the danger, so to speak, when we are in the diaspora. And Asaf and Amalek says, you know what? Let them destroy themselves. When we're going back to our homeland, we're connecting, so to speak, to our identity and to our national mission and standing. That's when there is a threat or that's when they're threatened and that's when they attack. Maybe Amalek does not mind if we flourish outside the land of Israel. It's only when we have this confluence of spiritual and physical, when there's this beautiful harmony, the secret sauce of greatness, Jewish people in the land of Israel, only then are we a threat to Amalek and only then do they attack. Many amazing answers. And again, thank you all for sending in your answers. 
I want to share with you all an approach that I heard from my grandfather, blessed memory. But I want to maybe give a few introductions. Number one, you notice in the beginning and the end of Parsifal Yetze, Jacob is sending angels and Jacob is receiving angels. And there's angels going up and angels going down. Rashi tells us that these are different angels. There's the angels of the land of Israel and they're leaving because Jacob's leaving the land of Israel. And then there's the angels of the diaspora, and they're coming to protect him. And at the end of the parsha, after he's lived this whole crazy experience with Laban, he's going back to the land of Israel, and then he meets angels at the end. These are the angels of the land of Israel to come to protect him. So I think the first thing that we notice is if the protection granted to Jacob is different in the land of Israel than out of the land of Israel, you can imagine that the threats that Jacob faces in each place are different. So what exactly is the threat of Esav slash Amalek? So of course, like I mentioned earlier, this is a very big subject in Jewish philosophy. Very big subject. But briefly, there is a concept called klipa. I'm sure many of y'all have heard of this concept. It's a very foundational concept in Kabbalah. Klipa means appeal, like you have a, an apple. An apple has a peel upon it that's protecting, that's sheathing, that's covering the actual fruit. So that's a concept, of course, that exists in the physical material world. You have a, a, a seed and then there is a shell. You have a fruit and there's a peel. That's the way things work in the physical world. And that, of course, is paralleled in the spiritual world. There is a spiritual peel that's covering the spiritual fruit that is desirous. And what we need to do is we have to peel away. We have to remove the peel, the klipa, to be able to discover the actual fruit that we want. So, in fact, the Kabbalists tell us that when you have a question, a question is a good thing or is it a bad thing? A question, say the Kabbalists, is a klipa, it's a peel. In itself is not very helpful, but it allows you to potentially discover what's beneath the peel, what's behind the facade, what's underneath the shell, and discover the fruit, the thing that you desire. And by the way, the greater the fruit, the thicker the peel, thicker the klipa, the thicker the shell that covers it. And therefore, when you see someone that has a very, let's say, terrible desire for a certain sin, that is actually evidence that that area is where they have the most capacity for holiness. Because if you see a thick shell, you know there must be a really juicy, robust fruit beneath that thick shell. And thus, we could maybe say that our mission as Jews, is to try to penetrate the peel, the shell, and unearth and surface the fruit. So what is the role of a malik? The kind of threat that a malik presents to the Jewish people is a unique threat. Most peels, shall we say, most klipot, most shells, if you shine a bright light in it, so to speak, it melts away. It evaporates. And thus, the Jewish people leave Egypt. And who found, who, and who finds out about this? Everyone, the, all the nations find out that everyone's trembling. And there's one nation that stands stoic and says, I am going to attack this nation when they seem to be invincible. And that is Amalek. What a Amalek does, the nature of the klipa, so to speak, of a Amalek is to try to limit the revelation from being actualized. It's there to, so to speak, sever between the knowledge and the expression, the manifestation of that knowledge. What happens after the Exodus? The whole world knows that God is in control. 
Look what he's doing here. Look how he's humbling the Egyptians. Look how he's redeeming his people. The Almighty controls it all. That's what everyone sees. You know who else sees that? Amalek sees that. And Amalek is now activated. Because that bit of knowledge, that could lead to real change. That could be actualized. And Amalek's power, so to speak, or its threat, is at the crossroads between insight and actualization. When the Jewish people are coming from the lowest point, and they have this insight, and now they're going to go actualize it in the land of Israel, right away, there's this force that gets triggered that's there to try to stop it. We are a great nation. And if there's a great nation, there's got to be a, an anti-great nation. There's got to be a counterweight to us. Something that's the exact opposite of us. When we're nowhere near our destiny, Amalek is not activated. It's only if we get kind of close to this fruit, so to speak, only then does the shell, does the peel, does the klipa, if you will, become activated. Asaph, he's someone who has his head severed from his body. And like we mentioned in the past, that symbolizes a certain flaw where what you know does not affect what you do, how you live, who you actually are. That's Amalek. Amalek is when the revelation, the discovery has been ignited and it's about to become real. It's about to kind of make that very long and treacherous journey from your head to your body, to who you are. That's when that particular klipa comes to life. And thus Amalek only attaches us when so to speak, its role to play is present. At the point of transformation from spiritual poverty to spiritual greatness, that happens after, in the aftermath of a great revelation, that's when Amali comes to bear. And thus, Jacob's in Padana Ram, he's in Mesopotamia. There's no Amalek there. That's not where Amalek is. When he's about to kind of Unite these worlds, bring it all together, make it all real in the land of Israel, specifically at that juncture, at that crossover point, that nexus, that is when Amalek comes to life. And that is the theme that is repeated again and again. And perhaps we could even suggest, we talked about this multiple times already, that you have Messiah. Well, that's the idea of ultimate actualization of of everything, right? That's when everyone knows and it becomes completely incontrovertible to all that the Almighty exists. It's all real. Torah is real. Jewish people is real. Everything is, as we've said, it has been for all the years. And the last enemy that we face, the last hurdle we have to overcome before that is done is particularly this Klippah Amalek. And once we overcome that, Maybe like we mentioned earlier, even Amalek will yield something positive. But until we get really close, then they're not even present. When we're on the doorstep, on the threshold of actualizing our destiny, that's when we have to face the last frontier, the last battle. It's almost like a trope in in great stories of fiction, right? Right when you're about to get the goal to make the discovery, right then, that's when the most formidable, so to speak, of enemies surfaces. And that's Amalek. And, of course, we hope to one day witness this great final triumph over Amalek. Of course, we are familiar with the apocalyptic prophecies that talk about a, a great final clash and that's the idea of Gog and Magog, what that is, who knows, hopefully we'll be able to witness and find out for ourselves. But that's the idea of Amalek. The idea of Amalek is not when we're weak and feeble and nowhere near what we're supposed to be as a nation. That's not when, I'm, that's not when we're a great nation. It's not when we're on the verge of becoming that great nation. And that's not when Amalek attacks us. It's only 
when we are actually close, that's when we have to face our greatest enemy. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed this new format. I know it went a little bit long, but if you're still here, I appreciate you. Have an amazing Shabbos. Thank you so much for your friendship and for your support and for your listenership. I deeply appreciate you. The best audience in the world. My email address is rabbiwobishab.com. Look forward to hearing from you. Please, God, we'll talk again next week.